Hey everyone, I'm John, and welcome to another episode of Talking Cardboard. Today I'm going to continue going over my top 30 games of 2020 list. Uh, today I've got games 15 through 11 for you. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, you know, feel free to subscribe or comment below. Uh, we love interacting with our community, and I personally would love to uh, hear what you have to say about the games I'm choosing uh, on this list and uh, provide feedback on that. So. Without further ado, let's dive into it. All right, coming in at number 15 is Raiders of the North Sea. Raiders of the North Sea is a game we've always played and I really enjoyed, but the Viking theme I think is really solid in this game and it's really bumped it up the list quite a bit over kind of where I had it in previous years. Raiders of the North Sea is a pretty typical Euro style board game. Uh, there are some really cool mechanics that they came up with for this game that kind of create a unique twist on just playing a worker and taking resources. Um, like most Euro games, basically in Raiders of the North Sea, you basically take your po uh, worker pawn, you place it on the board, take the action of the location you chose, and then you also get to take another player's or previously played uh, worker token off the board from a location and take that location's action. It really creates this interesting dynamic of, you know, being aware that an action you take might then later benefit another player, and yet they'll be a little cognizant of like preventing giving someone exactly what they want, and you know forcing them to kind of choose that space instead of you providing you know that second action where they pull off the worker and then get to take that action. It's a little different, kind of unique. I like it. I think the actions in this game too are really cool and really fit the Viking theme very well. Um, basically, you're using workers to get gold or iron that you're using to improve the strength of your warriors. Um, you can go to the Great Hall and you're recruiting warriors to join your crew, which then you send um, out on your longboats to plunder, you know, monasteries or fortifications across the land. And obviously, depending on the location you're going to plunder, the rewards get greater and greater, but there's more requirements and resources or army strength um, that you need in order to go to some of these spots. And obviously, you know, the more difficult a place is to plunder, uh, the more bonus points you're getting for endgame scoring. Some of the other things you can gain with your workers is like meat and coins, which you use coin to buy crew onto your longboat. Or, you know, you can spend mead to help bolster the strength of your warriors, because obviously that makes them brave and strong. Getting back to the crew that you're recruiting onto your longboat, all these characters that you uh, have the option of you know, talking onto your crew either with gold or meat or whatever, um, each have special abilities that you take either when you play them onto your crew or if they're in your hand, you can actually play them in town for like a special one-time ability such as getting more resources or drawing more cards and getting more crew into your hand or some of them even when they put get played onto your boat provide like end game scoring or bonus points for certain locations that you plunder, uh, bosses that you go out and fight. So. The crew that you can recruit into this game, I think, really add um, a cool dynamic to the game. And there's, I think, a fair number of different crew members you can recruit. Um, you know, that kind of gives a lot of replayability to this game, which I really like. And there you have it at number 15. That's Raiders of the North Sea. Coming in at number 14 is a game I actually never thought I'd like, but really, really surprised me, and I think everyone in our group. But that game is horrified, and this game has an awesome theme. It's all based around the Universal uh, Pictures monster movies. You know, you've got Frankenstein, Dracula, The Mummy, uh, The Creature from the Black Lagoon, The Werewolf, and, you know, a couple other ones are included in this game. Can't remember them all off the top of my head. This is a co-op game where the main objective is to work together in order to defeat these monsters. But what's really, really cool about this game is at the beginning, depending on what difficulty you want to play, uh, you're drafting basically 
a certain number of these monsters at random, which are then placed onto the board, each with their own unique uh, like monster board or objective board. And basically, they all have different methods for, you know, completing objectives that will eventually allow you to build up to defeat the monster. So like Dracula, for example, his unique mechanism is that, you know, crypts are placed or coffins are placed around the board at four various locations and you have to get there and collect items in order to actually destroy his coffins. And then finally you need to collect a certain number of items in order to actually, you know, find Dracula, get to a space and defeat him. Obviously each monster has very, very unique objectives and I mean, it's really cool what they put in here, and it really makes it so that things are shaken up every time you play this game, and I think that's awesome. Not only are the monsters unique, but also the player characters that you're allowed to choose from are unique. So each player character comes with a certain number of actions they can take each turn. Uh, they all have a special ability, whether it's helping you take more actions, or moving other players, or having the ability to like pick up items from adjacent spaces. They all are really unique and kind of give you a better feel for maybe what your character should be doing uh, as you're playing this game and how you can really help the group. And I think that makes a good dynamic for making it feel like everyone has their part to play in the game and you know their strengths for helping defeat the monster. Another really great thing I like about this game is kind of the mechanic they added of this terror track. Uh, basically the terror track is just a track that goes up to eight and any time a villager or a hero dies, it goes up by one. And essentially, once that terror track gets to eight, you know, the heroes automatically lose the game. So, you know, the monsters have overwhelmed the town. There's nothing else you can do. Uh, it's really kind of thematic. I think it's cool. Another, you know, loss condition that you have to keep track of and be very mindful. You can't just let the villager or the townsfolk do their own thing. You have to make sure to interact with them to some extent. Yeah, that's Horrified. Really great theme. Uh, definitely would recommend it playing around the holiday season at, or the Halloween season at the very least because it just fits so perfectly and um, it's a blast. Co-op game. Easy to learn definitely will be in my top games of all time, I think, for forever, probably. So, that's horrified. Alright, coming at number 13 is another Euro game. I have Heaven and Ale. Now, I think, again, theme is really important to me, and this really hits the spot. Basically, you're taking over construction of a ancient monastery where the monks are trying to brew some really heavenly ale, hence the name Heaven and Ale. Another really good thing I like about this game, and will be of no surprise, is that there's a tile placement element to this game. Basically, you have a player board that has a sunny side and a shady side, and as you uh, gather tiles, the cost to play a resource onto the board is either double the cost for the sunny side, because that means they're more valuable resources, higher quality, and when you harvest things on the sunny side, it's resources that are going into your um, production board. Whereas on the shady side, that's kind of just where you're, you know, selling off um, everything in order to get money. Another thing with the player board is that each uh, section of the board has a shed hexagon, which is then surrounded by six other tile placement uh, zones. As you fill up these tile placement zones and finally hit or have them completely filled up, that triggers a shed to be built. So once you have the ability to create a shed, you basically add up the value of all your tiles around that center hexagon, and based on that, you get to take a shed token and place it. Now, the higher your total value of the tiles surrounding the shed, the more the shed token is going to have these little arrows on it that are going to allow the different tiles around it, surrounding it to trigger. So when a tile is triggered, it either allows you to move up your resource marker on your scoring board it either, or sell off um, resources for money, which then you can use to later buy more resources of monks onto your board, uh, which is very important as money is pretty limited in this game. But also, you know, you might trigger a monk, which the monks have unique abilities of triggering adjacent tiles, or if they trigger another monk, you're moving your brewmaster up the board. 
but you really have to think about it because the downside of having you know a really high value around your center hexagon is that uh, the higher the value, the less spaces you get to move up your brewmaster. And your brewmaster moving up the scoring track uh, is going to provide a lot of bonus points if you can get it up onto the actual point where it's actually getting you points. So you really have to balance, you know, some of the really high value toke or tiles onto your board versus the low value tiles. So there you have it at number 13, Heaven and Now. Alright, coming in at number 12 is another Euro game, but this is pretty much the quintessential Euro game. I think this is the Euro game that introduced me to the genre. Uh, it has a really strong theme, um, and this game is Lords of Waterdeep. What I really like in this game is the secret bonus objectives you start the game with that kind of set the pace for what you're looking to do. Each player gets a unique one. Uh, they never have to share until the end game scoring comes around. Yeah, it's kind of hard to tell what people are going for for the most part, but I think it's just a really cool little twist to the game that gives you some guidelines of what to go for as you're playing the game. Now, the main objective of this, of this game is to complete these quest cards that you're getting throughout the game. And basically to do that, you're sending your agents out onto the board to collect adventurers or other resources um, that then go into your tavern, which you then use to pay to complete these quests. So like, a quest might be to go slay a monster or something, and basically you have to send your agents out to collect clerics or fighters or rogues or wizards at the different locations of the board, which then you, which are your little resource cues, and then you spend those to complete the quest. And each quest has a certain number of bonus points associated to it, or could include other bonus resources such as, you know, gold that you can get, or some of them might give you back uh, other adventures that you can then store in your tavern to use on future quests that you have. Um, but each quest is unique, um, and I think that mechanic is really cool of how you're kind of planning on how to complete your quest and then use the completed quest that you just did to then further your goals to your other quests that you have in play. Um, one of the other cool mechanics in this game is that one of the actions you can take is to construct buildings that then provide other actions to players on the board. Um, if you are the one to construct the building, when you play it you get to put your little faction token on the building and whenever someone else takes that action uh, you actually get a smaller bonus action due to them using your building. Again, super powerful and can really cause people to, you know, really weigh that risk of, you know, is it worth them getting three clerics if they're giving you one if you're really close to completing your quest, especially in the late game. Like, players are really have to weigh that risk reward and, you know, hopefully come out ahead with the more points, obviously. So I think that's a really cool mechanic that I really like it in Lords of Waterdeep. And with that, that's number 12, Lords of Waterdeep. Finally, coming in at number 11 is a game that Corey has talked up for so long, probably since we started playing board games, and I don't think we actually got the chance to play until last year. And that game is Stockpile. Now this game is great, simple, fun. It's just basically a stock market themed game. You take on the role of an iconic character. I mean, obviously they're named a little different than the real life characters, but they each come with a unique ability that is uh, relative to the stock market. And all the unique abilities are pretty powerful. And each unique character also comes with like a starting amount of money that you uh, begin the game with. And I think that's kind of based and balanced out by the special abilities. So I think Warren Buffett character has the most money at the start of the game but really has no special ability they just get to start with the most money which can be beneficial during the bidding and auction phase uh, of the game so in this game each round every player is given one face down stock and one face down forecast card that tells them how that stock is going to change when you finally get to the mani manipulation phase of the game there's also one stock and forecast place face up in the middle of the table that all the players have that general knowledge that that stock is going to change by that much. From there, everything else is just a guessing game. What you're trying to do is you're creating these stockpiles at the bottom of the board with both face-up cards and face-down cards, and 
Each player then takes turns going through the auction phase bidding on these stockpiles. Depending, you know, where you play your face down cards, you might know a certain value of a row or a stockpile uh, that other players aren't knowing. Obviously, some players have the ability to look at these face down cards of one stockpile, and that's super powerful. But basically, you're just taking piles, you know, turns, bidding on these stockpiles, and whatever you get, you secretly get the take, put into your portfolio, and then what happens is that as the turn or the phases keep progressing, you have an um, opportunity to sell any stocks off, but you know, you gotta be careful because you don't wanna tip players off by selling off all your stocks that you know are gonna go downhill, or you know, by holding on to stocks that you know are gonna, you know, go up in value, and you're really trying to manage like the risk of a normal stock market um, of weighing whether or not you should be selling now or holding on to the stocks that you have. It just all kind of builds on this, you know, perceived value of each stockpile that you end up bidding on. And, you know, it's just a lot of risk reward management and, you know, really making sure that when you get to that auction phase, you're not bidding over what the value of that stockpile is going to end up being. And I think that's just really cool and really fun to uh, manipulate and play with. I really, really have a good time with this game. I think there's so much depth to this game, so much replayability, just the way the mechanics work and all that push your luck. Or I don't typically like auction style type games, but with all the other phases and the way the mechanics combine, um, the auction phase in this game makes a lot of sense. It's you know simple. It's just part of the strategy of this game, and I love everything about this game. There's really no cons I can think of. There you have it, number 11, Stockpile. And with that, I just want to thank you all for stopping by and you know hearing what my top 15 to 11 games are. And until next time, peace.